Well, that uh, David Gerster was here yesterday. He was talking about BigML, but just in case anybody missed his talk, um, it's machine learning for everyone. That's kind of our tagline, and we're trying to make this machine learning platform in the cloud. Not trying, we've succeeded. Um, and the, the focus is making it super easy to use, but we hide all the complexity in the background. It's very scalable, uh, but you don't have to deal with that part. So for the actual talk today, though, rather than you know, just go through and show you, um, you know, the UI or do a basic demo, what I'm going to do is, is actually run through a, uh, a, 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 a lending club analysis. And uh, before we do that, it's, a, it's important to give you a disclaimer. <laughs> all right, so we're playing with this data from lending club. It's all the data that's in here. I didn't synthesize it. It is actually from lending club. You can go to their site. They download CSVs. It's very easy to get access to this uh, very rich data. Uh, I forgot. Do you guys know what Lending Club is? Anybody? So, so it's peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, right? So the idea is if you want a loan, you can file an application and other individuals, uh, individual people, not banks, will actually fund that loan. Uh, and they provide all this data, very rich data source that you can mine and you can try to decide, for example, which loans uh, might be lower risk or higher risk. And you can play with this data however you like. So we are, we're playing with the real data but it's been filtered, okay? So part of the reason why is because the data sets they offer are quite large, and I wanted to make something that runs very quick, uh, and also that runs in development mode, so that if you guys want to follow along, uh, if you already have a big ML account, you can actually do this in parallel, and it'll work without having to have a subscription or anything crazy. So I've scaled the file down, did some sampling, and uh, I definitely cheated a little bit here and there and cleaned some stuff up, but I'd be happy to disclose exactly what I did. But the most important thing is this is not meant to be financial advice. So please don't run out and start investing in loans after this talk. Um, this is just an example of what you could do, not necessarily what you should do. Okay. So the goal. So the, the, the most interesting field to me anyways is this loan status. And you've got all these different kinds of statuses. Some of them are what I, what I term like a final disposition. These are loans that I consider closed. They've either been paid off or they've gone into default. Uh, and then there's other ones that are open that are still maybe late payments or um, they're being paid on time. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to split these into closed and open. And then I want to use these closed loans, the things that have a final disp disposition, we know what happened to them, to model, make, try to create a model that can predict this final disposition. And then we want to go through all the open loans, the stuff that you could actually still bid on, and, uh, and try to rank them by making predictions. And actually, we're going to do a little bit of anomaly detection and clustering too. and some other tricks. All right, so just, just to make sure that's crystal clear, this is the, the loan life cycle. All right, so you have loans that start off when they get funded, they, you know, it's the first time you make a payment, it's current. If you're always paying, uh, it stays current and then eventually it becomes fully paid, so that's good. Of course, if, you make a, if you're late on your payment, it goes into a grace period. And if you're still late, it just keeps escalating. Eventually your loan goes into fault and at some point probably gets charged off, all right? And the, the important distinction on this graph is that the stuff on the left there, in that gray box, those are the things that I'm going to consider open. All right? they're, they're, they don't have a final state yet. They're still changing state all the time. And the stuff on the right is the closed stuff. This is the stuff that we can, we can use to create a predictive model. And that S3 link is the file that I'm actually going to use for this demonstration. Uh, it's publicly available. Um, I did not check the uh, Lending Club rules to make sure that I could reshare a sample, so hopefully they don't send me a nasty email later. But anyways, for now, that is the actual link, and if, you got, if anyone's following along, you can uh, pull that S3 link. But let's go ahead and do this. So I, I get to talk a little bit about, the, we're going to use the UI, and then I'm going to show you the API at the end. So since we have that uh, URL in S3, we can go ahead and pull it in. Assuming I don't make any typos. All right, so while that's downloading, I'll just talk a little bit. The sources tab is this, this is the first step in our workflow. This is where you get the data in. This is a cloud tool, so you got to get the data in there. There's different ways you can do it. You can actually just drag and drop files. Uh, you can do a direct upload. Uh, this S3 is an example of something we have, what we call remote sources. So you can actually do uh, HTTP links, S3 links, and we've done an integration with uh, Microsoft Azure, OData blobs, and things like that. So you can pull your data in. From, from cloud sources as well. 
We've also done in integration directly with the Azure Marketplace uh, and with Dropbox as well. So you can browse through Dropbox and pull your files in from there. Once you upload a file, we give you this peak. And if you were to look at the original data, it would be rota this is rotated 90 degrees. So we do this because one of the things about our tool is that you can, you can work with very, very wide data sets, maybe 100,000 features. All right, and if you do that, it would be very painful to paginate through them. So we rotate this 90 degrees so that, you, so that you can paginate features instead of instances. So we can just take a real quick look at the features that are in this data set, you know, so we can see we've got a loan amount, the term, what the interest rate is going to, what the interest rate funded at, the monthly payments. Um, we've got some text fields in here. All right, so we have numeric fields, we have categorical fields, and we have text fields, and they're all mixed together. Um, that won't, that, that's perfectly fine, no, no worries there. And then we have the loan status, which is this field that we're going to play with a little bit. So if any of these field types were wrong, this is, you change them in the source view before you go to the next step. They're, they're okay though, so we'll go ahead and move on to the data set. So this is the first time that we actually analyze the entire file. So we're gonna scan over the whole source uh, and compute these summary statistics and build something that we call a data set. Okay, and the idea with the data set, these are the fundamental building blocks for everything you do in BigML. Okay, data sets make data sets, they make models, they make clusters, they make anomalies, um, anomaly detectors, et cetera. So for any of the numer or numeric fields, you know, you get a nice histogram and a univariate distribution. Uh, for the text fields, we'll give you a tag cloud. So you can get an idea of how the tokens are distributed in those unstructured text fields. As you can see, manager is uh, very common. It's interesting. Lots of managers need loans. And the thing I want to look at, though, is the loan status. So we can see in this distribution, we've got the charged off, current, default, fully paid, in grace, late, and the other late. Okay, so this is the first thing, we remember, we want to do is now we want to split this. We want to make the open and the closed data set. Uh, so fortunately, we can do this by filtering this data set. And I'm going to filter on the loan status. And now for the closed ones, this will be anything that's fully paid. Default or charged off. And we'll call this LC closed. And we don't have to wait for that. We can go back and start the other one too. So now the corollary, anything that's current, late, in grace, and the other late, perfect. And we'll call these ones open and we'll come back and use those again. All right, so let's go back out and look at our filtered data set. So we'll look at the closed again. And now we should see the loan status better only have the fields we selected. Yes, so now we see we have charged off default and fully paid. Now this, for my, my concerns, um, I don't really care if it's defaulted or charged off, right? Because something that's defaulted is probably gonna get charged off eventually anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, those are just both bad loans. So I'd really rather have a field that just had those both labeled as bad, and the ones that got fully paid labeled as good, right? So this is something we can do with our add fields. And I, I should mention, I didn't show you in the filtering, of course, there's lots of filtering you can do in there. You can even do S expressions, you can do programmatic filtering. But you're gonna see an S expression right now, and uh, it's scary enough for me to do these live, so we'll do just this one. So we'll call this new field quality, and what we'll do is make a JSON S expression, and this is how these look. So I'm just I'm basically just gonna create an if statement, all right? And what I want to do is I want to know if this is Lisp, right? So these are the operators come first. I want to know if my field, which I can specify this way, that selects a field. I want to know if it's equal to this is the closed data set, so fully paid. And if it is, I'll call this good. And if it isn't, I'll call it bad. Right. So now at the bottom of the data set, we should have a nice new field called quality, and we have all the instances that were charged off and default there. 
and all the good instances were the ones that were fully paid. All right, so um, I'm glad I remembered this, but before I try modeling this, I need to take out the loan status, okay? Because what's gonna happen is that we built this new field from the loan status, and so they're highly correlated. And all that's gonna happen if I try to model it now is I'm gonna get a model that says, hey, when the loan status is uh, fully paid, then the quality is good. So that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be interesting at all. So I will, I'll sample this again and take out the loan status. I probably could have done this at one step, I just forgot. So we'll take it out. And let's, let's make a model. So for this, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a one-click model just so I can kind of show you what our, our uh, modeling visualization looks like. Okay, again, so our model is trying to predict quality. All right, and so this obviously is a decision tree for you guys that are familiar with uh, machine learning tools in general. And so with that root node, what we're basically gonna have is the feature that uh, is the most significant, right? It's, well, not significant, it's not, contributes to the information gain, all right? It's an entropy function. Uh, and in this case, it is actually the interest rate, which actually seems pretty reasonable because in some regard, you've got this big market economy, right? And people are looking at the loans, they're saying that's a bad loan, so I'm only gonna give you, you know, 20%, or 30%. Okay, so I was gonna push the interest rate up for things that the market thinks are bad. So that, that's encouraging. Uh, and on the, the right-hand side here, we have as long as the interest rate is less than about 16.7, then just at that one node, we're predicting that this will be a good loan with a confidence of 95%. So that's, a, that's an interesting signal. You'll notice that some of these nodes are dashed. Okay, so all that means is that we're just hiding some information there to compress this view. And you can actually click on those and see the branches that are hiding from you. I recall there being one closer, but I won't descend too far. Um, you can also, if you just want to see predictions for things that are bad, you can filter this view, and now these are, these are bad ones. So here we have uh, interest rate less than 16, but the uh, total received late fees is greater than $7, right? So this, this loan's had a couple of late fees, and that's not a good indicator. <coughs> All right, so I don't want to dwell too much on the visualization because I want to stay focused on the loan, but I do want to show you the sunburst as well. And this is just that tree, but now the root node is in the center. Okay, and each of these rings is, a, is the splits we were looking at before. And this right now is colored by confidence. So the areas that are green are uh, highly confident, and the areas that are red are lower confidence. Uh, and you can actually descend down these branches. You can see the splits that are being made. So, if, for example, the employment title doesn't contain an examiner, et cetera, et cetera. You can also change the coloration so you can just see the predicted classes. So good versus bad. And you can also see the coloration on how it's splitting. Right, so this is showing you at each split what feature it's using. Now, obviously, we can, this, we're just exploring this model. This is one of the advantages of decision trees, of course, is that you can just look at how it decided, right, um, and get a, some kind of a sense of why it, how it's making these decisions. So we could go through now, and we could, you know, score the open models or the open, uh, open instances. But, uh, you know, are we going to be rich yet? There's kind of a problem, right? We have no idea if this model is doing anything useful at all. It looks great, and I know I can be reasonably convincing, but uh, it's not statistically convincing yet. So instead of instead of trying to do anything with that, let's let's go back to our our data set here, and let's do a training and test split. Not before I do that. So what we're going to do is an evaluation. All right, so we're going to take this one data set we have, we're going to split it. Uh, by default, we do an 80-20, but of course, you can control this if you want. And the idea now is you just build your model. Instead of the whole data set, you just use this whole, the training set. And then the holdout is your test set. You can now make predictions against that test set. The model never saw those. Okay, so it's, it's a statistically significant you know, evaluation. Uh, and then you can compare the known outcomes to the predicted values. And this gives you some kind of a sense of how well your model is performing with data it's never seen before. All right, so we'll take, so if I go, if I go out here, you'll see you have training and test. And actually, we can just do this with a one-click model. All right. And then what we're going to do is from this model, we'll call an evaluation. And it's already selected the test set, so I'll just let this run. Okay. So, wow, 91% accuracy. Great model, right? So it's fantastic, right? 
It's great. Everybody, yeah, we're going to be millionaires. No, nah, there's a problem. The problem is hiding in this confusion matrix. Okay, so the, the problem is that our classes are really unbalanced. Okay, so our, our, our data set has just a few bad loans and lots and lots and lots of good ones. Okay, so basically what this model is doing is it's, it's essentially preferring the good loans, all right? So in other words, if I have 100 instances and 99, uh, it's like a fraud data set, for example, 99 of them were not fraud and one is fraud, I could just give you a model that ignores all the input features and just says it's not fraud, and that would be 99% accurate. Okay, the problem, it's not really a problem with the algorithm, the problem is that from a business perspective or from what we're trying to do, we care more about the bad loans than we do about the good. We wouldn't mind ignoring a few of the good loans if we catch more of the bad loans. All right, we can see in this confusion matrix when the loan is bad and we predicted bad was 11, and when the loan was bad and we predicted good was 82. So we got 82 of those bad loans wrong. Okay, so we're doing pretty good on the good loans, all right, 96%, but only 11% of the bad loans. So how do, how do we fix this? Because we, we, we don't want to invest in bad loans. That's no good. So I'm going to show you a couple of different ways. So now instead of doing the one-click model, I'm going to come into the configure model panel. And one thing you can do is you can just ask it to reweight the objectives. All right, and there's a few choices for weighting. One is we can just do what's called a balance objective. And this will just weight the classes so they all have about equal representation. All right. Um, you can also specify your own weight fields. You can actually have a feature in your data set that specifies the weight for every instance. And if you're uh, familiar with uh, boosting, okay, that's, that's actually, you can use that weight field to do a boosting algorithm, right? Because you can basically add the weights, do your batch prediction, see which ones you got wrong, increase the weight on those, see which ones you got right, decrease the weight on those, cycle round and round. And you can also specify weights specific to objectives. So I can, what I can do is I can come and say, look, just take this bad, and give them a weight of 100. So all those instances that are marked bad are gonna have 100 times the weight of the good instances. All right, so let's see what this does. This tree is probably gonna look a little different. All right, and we'll do the evaluation again. <laughs> Test set, perfect. Okay, so now the accuracy you can see has come down quite a bit. But how are we doing on the bad models? Okay, so now the times when it's bad and we predicted bad is 36. I think it was 12 before, right, or something. So we were definitely doing a little better here. And you can see what we've traded is the good loans, right? The before this was like 1,100 good loans or something. Now it's only 962. All right, but that's, again, this is, this is, this is matching what I'm, what I'm set out to do, which is I want to find like the lowest risk loans, essentially. Uh, and so as long as I can identify the bad loans better, I can pay more attention to the ones that are really good. All right, but maybe we can do better than this. So one way that we can try is what's called an ensemble. So rather than build a single tree, we're gonna build multiple trees. Okay, so why on earth does that work? So imagine you had this data set, and you know, so we're trying to predict what kind of fruit we have, a plum or an apple, based on just the diameter in centimeters and the color and the shape. All right, and if you look at this, you can see that that six centimeter plum is a really unusual plum, right? That's, that's a huge plum. Uh, and so this, what that is is an outlier. Okay, now I look at this small data set, I'm looking at it, I could just take it out. And when I build this model, it's gonna generalize better, okay? But you don't always know where those outliers are. They can be hard to find. So again, just to reiterate, the problem is that if I build my model with this entire data set, and I ask the model what a round red six centimeter fruit is, it's probably going to say a plum, <coughs> all right? But I'd really rather this model generalize better and say an apple in that case, right? Because I got apples below and apples above, and that's the only plum in that range. So since I don't necessarily know where it is, I could just do a random sample, right? I could just take some. Well, in that case, I picked the plum, bad luck, all right? But we could do it again and build another model. Now, I didn't pick the plum, so now this model is going to say apple. That's good. Maybe we do it again, a different sample. Now we get another model that says apple. So what's happening here is that we build a whole family of trees, and because that outlier is just that one instance, on the average, it's not going to make it into every single model. So now when we want to make a prediction, we ask each model for a prediction, 
and then we combine those predictions together and we've removed the effect of the outlier. Because what I've just described is called bagging, is where you build an ensemble just by taking random samples for each tree. You can go a little further on this and you can actually randomize the features. So rather than just randomizing instances, at each split in the tree, you just choose different features randomly. And if you do this, then you get a random decision forced. All right, so let's have some fun. And well, I think it's fun, but maybe I'm weird. Uh, but let's go ahead and configure an ensemble. And we'll do the same, the same weighting. Let's see what I do. Objective weight of 100. Uh, we'll stick with 10 models. That's fine. We'll do a decision forest, random decision forest. This looks good. All right, so now we get 10 models. And just so you guys can see how this works, if I ask this ensemble for a prediction, uh, we'll just put in some random data. I guess that wasn't random. Uh, we'll ask it for a prediction. And you can see what's happening is that all 10 trees are making a vote. Just I gave it basically empty data, just one field. All right, but you can see how they're voting, right? So this first tree is voting good with a very high confidence. The next tree is voting bad with a slightly lower confidence, et cetera. Uh, and there's different ways you can combine these votes together. By default, you just plurality. It's like majority wins, like an election. You can also change this to confidence weighted, which just gives a little more weight to the models that are more confident. And then there's this K threshold thing, and I'm going to show you that one in a second. But before we do it, let's, let's just see how this ensemble performs. And the result will surprise you. All right, oh, so the accuracy is abysmal. That might be good, let's find out. Okay, so we're actually doing quite a bit better on the bad loans. Um, only one escaped us this time. And the good loans, however, we're doing, we're doing super bad, <laughs> right? Okay, and, and this, is, this actually is, you know, the thing about random decision force, every time we run this, it's a little bit different. Um, so you never, you never know quite what you're gonna get. So you, sometimes you have to run this a bunch of times. But I did, um, this isn't a very good example, but actually, so we can reverse this. So rather than do the plurality, what we can do now is we can come back to the ensemble and we can play with this K threshold. So if we wanted to, let's say we want to artificially constrain it. So now we have an ensemble that's voting too much, right? It's, it's saying bad too often. Maybe we want to tune it up a little bit in an artificial way. So we can actually come back to this ensemble and when we do the evaluation, we can, we can play with it. So we can change how it makes the voting and we can set this arbitrary limit of the K threshold. So normally what I do when, if, I'm, if I want to constrain it towards bad, is I'll say, look, you can only vote good loan if nine trees agree. So nine out of 10 trees have to vote good and then that label point will be labeled good. Uh, in this case, I kind of want to boost the good. So maybe we could say uh, it's only going to be bad if uh, I don't know, seven trees. So that gives me, because plurality would be around six, oh, we could try eight, nah, let's just try this. And it's, it's, in case you're wondering, it's all right if this doesn't work out, because, I mean, this is what you do. You know, you play, right? You go back. Part of what, the, um, what we offer in this tool is that we make it easy to do this, right? So you can go back and say, well, I want to do 20 trees, or maybe I just want to try bagging. And you can do this cycle very, very quickly and very visually, all right? And everything I'm doing is being stored. So I have a history of everything I did, so I can see the Accuracy definitely came up a bit. Let's see how we're doing on the confusion matrix. Um, so yeah, I mean, that actually worked, right? We traded, we traded back a little bit. We're picking up a few, uh, a few more good loans. I think that was 37 before or something. So 130 is a little better. You know, so we go back and we could do this again, maybe with seven or six or something and see if we can tune it. But I, I think I've belabored that point enough. So we'll leave it. But what I want to do is go ahead and this, this is a, an important step that I always forget, which is that after you've done the training and test set and you've decided what kind of model you're gonna use to do your scoring, you need to go back to the full data set and apply it. All right, so we'll go back 
to the full data set. What do you guys like? Decision forest? Mm. Yeah, we'll just do a balance objective. I know that one works pretty well. We'll create that. So this will be the ensemble that we'll use to actually do the final scoring. All right. Okay, so now let, let's just assume that we've, we've picked the absolute best algorithm. Um, and now we can go through the open loans, right? And we can score them. And now we'll be millionaires, right? You guys are not excited. That's all right. Okay, well, let's try it. So what we can do is we can do this batch prediction. And we can go over the open. And so what it's going to do is take every instance in the open set, okay, and it's going to uh, give me all the fields back, but add the quality of that loan, all right? And if I click this little button here, it's going to give me a data set as well. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and do the, well, let's do a confidence weight. We'll just keep it plain. All right, so now I'm scoring all of the, the instances in the open set. And we can output this as a data set, or we can download it as a CSV if we just want to play with it in Excel now. But if we look at this new data set, we have all the same fields we have before. But for every instance, we now have uh, a prediction of the quality. Right? So this wasn't there before for the open loans. So this is the predicted field. OK, so now we're ready to be millionaires. Fantastic. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So what could possibly go wrong? This should look a lot like an evaluation, okay, because it's similar in some ways. So remember, we started with this Lending Club data set, and we split it into closed and open. And we didn't do this in a statistically meaningful way, right? We just chose ahead of time, oh, I'm going to call these ones the open, and these ones the closed. So, and then we built our model, and then we used it for predictions, and we're like, fantastic. But there's a problem here. I mean, what if these distributions aren't even the remotely similar, right? I mean, what if... What if uh, all the ones that are open are from the last year and Lending Club completely changed their application process and has totally different features? I mean, that, that means that model we built from those closed model instances has less to do. Okay, the model isn't competent on the open data sets. Oh my goodness, okay. All right, so how can we fix this? Well, if we had some way to measure the anomaly, the anomaly value of each of these instances, all right, then we could, we could add a score to each point and kind of give us an idea of how dissimilar it is from the distribution. And this would at least give us a check, right? Before we say, yeah, this one's predicting is a good loan, it seems to be confident, we could compare it with the anomaly score and, and have some confidence that the data that we're predicting matches the data we trained on. All right, so let's, let's do it. So we're gonna come back. Okay, <laughs> I didn't think I was doing that, okay. Um, where am I, closed. So we wanna come back to the closed data set and we're going to configure an anomaly detector. Uh, and I have to cheat a little bit because our... All right, so I, I just wanna explain how our anomaly detector works because it's actually, um, uh, it's pretty much cutting edge at this point. So basically the idea is you just build this random decision tree until each instance only. If you don't care about what features, you, just, you split different features, uh, and you just keep going until the instances are all separated. You know, why is this useful? Well, anything that's really far down in this tree, it took lots and lots of features to tell it apart from its neighbors. Okay, so those are things are hard to isolate. Anything that's way up high in the tree, it just took one or two things, it was easy to isolate. Okay, well isolation, is very similar to anomaly. If it's easy to isolate, it's probably an anomaly. Okay, now, so you, you get this idea of depth, and the depth relates to how anomalous it is. Of course, the, you know, a traditional statistical function, you don't do this once, you do this maybe 128 times, you average the results together, and you then um, express that average depth as a measure between zero and one. It's a little exponential function, so you get a nice uh, power curve in there. And you know, basically, if the score is zero, that's telling you it's very, very similar, which is essentially impossible or one, it's completely dissimilar. Okay, so this is a nice unit-free rank, uh, and I've already kicked it off. So the default, when you build the anomaly detector, just so you have something to look at, it shows you the top 10 anomalies. 
uh, and you can actually you can actually come in and drill down and see you know, this is the top anomaly in our closed data set and uh, we can we can kind of see why uh, some of these features let me get a so this is own you can see we don't have very many people that own for example I, I don't want to I'm sure in time, so I won't explain this too much. This is just showing you some of the top anomalies, but let's go ahead and score our open data set. So we'll do the same thing. It's kind of a batch anomaly score. And we're going to do it over the, what did I call it, this one? Okay, so now we're going to get a new, a new data set that has the, the output we did before, so it's got the quality in it, and now we're going to add the anomaly score. So we'll be able to see how anomalous all of the instances of the open data set are from the closed data set that we're training. And I want to do this as a data set. So basically what I'm doing is, uh, by doing this iteratively, I'm building up this nice um, collection of metrics that allow me to you know, make my, my uh, loan decisions. All right, so let's output this as a data set as well. And if we come down here, we'll see that we have this new score feature. So now we have the quality for each loan, and we have the, how anomalous it is from our, our uh, data set that we use to model. Okay? So we, we can actually still do a little bit better than this. I think. If we, if we look at this open data set, you know, we've got the, uh, the loan status. The loan status is here. And, you know, we've got this current... And in these states that are, they're maybe they're, they mean they're bad loans, okay? But there's, there's a little bit more going on. If we look at the loan life cycle again, right, we had these open and closed, and we, we made this additional step where we decided the fully paid were good and the ones down at the bottom were bad. Well, in, in reality, this arrow on the side where I'm drawing current down here, it's not one way, right? That's, that's a two-way street, right? A loan can be late, and then it can go back up to being current. And this can change all the time. It can be current for a couple months, late again, current again. What would be really great is if we, if we could say, look, anything that ever goes down into the orange there is trouble, all right? And anything that stays up there in the green current is the ones we want to focus on. So we get this idea of not trouble and trouble. So how can we do that? Well, th we don't, this time the loans can be changing all the time. So we, don't, we can't really build a model because we don't have a final state. We don't know what it's going to be but we can, we can cluster them together. So just, this is just briefly a clustering algorithm in general. Right, if I gave you this two-dimensional picture, I said, could you please cluster these into three groups? You would probably you know, get out a crayon and you'd draw circles like that. Pretty straightforward. And this, this is essentially what, what most clustering algorithms are trying to do. Right? They're trying to find the data points that are similar. So it's like the corollary of the anomaly detector, trying to find points that are similar. All right, and this is exactly what we're going to do. We'll take our open data set. Uh, before we before we do that though, I have to have to filter these. So add a field. We'll call this new field trouble. And I'll give it a JSON expression. And to keep this short, I'm going to cheat. Okay, but basically what I'm doing is it's an OR. So if the uh, if the loan status field is not current, right? Or if this other field, which is total received late fees, is not zero. That means they ever made a late fee. Okay, that means at some point it went down to the orange. It could be green, current now, but at some point it went to the orange. And so I can actually detect that and mark that as a trouble loan, even though it's current now. I can still call that a trouble loan. Something went wrong parsing your definition. See, you cut and paste. You figure it'll be perfect. So, or field loan status current. Uh, total receive late fee zero. Mm. Any Lisp experts here? What did I do wrong? Or not equal. Yeah. Did I lose a bracket? Maybe I did. Let's see. Uh, danger. Is it one extra? No. That should be there. Hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, field, not 
zero. Hmm. Well. Oh, you know what? I know exactly what happened. The cut and paste on OS 10 likes to replace the quotes with the quotes that go the other direction. That's killed me so many times. All right, so if loan status doesn't equal current, yes, or if anybody knows how to fix that, I'd love to know. Yep, quotes. The expression was perfect, wrong quotes. Sorry, guys. All right, so now we have our, our new feature. What's funny is that when I was practicing this, I was always typing it in so I could I'd get it. And then I was like, no, 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 I'll have to cut and paste in case I get it wrong, which is what, what killed me. OK, so now we have a new field, trouble. And what we want to do is cluster this. So let's go ahead and configure the cluster. Um, we'll have a MIG-10. That's all right. We'll model these. So I'll show you what this means in a second, but I, now I have to ramp this up a bit. Cluster, and I want to take, ah. I don't want it to, I don't want it to consider trouble, the trouble field when it's clustering. I want it to be able to find loans that are similar without looking at whether or not they're being marked as trouble so that I can find the ones. Basically, the, the idea here is that I'm going to build these clusters and try to find out where all the ones that are marked as trouble are and assume that the ones that are, um, the clusters that are heavily trouble are clusters that I'll just avoid. I mean, that's the basic idea. I'm trying to group these loans together and see, you know, if this cluster has lots of bad ones, eh, probably everybody else in there is bad too, or maybe it's riskier than I want. But when I do that, I don't want it to know ahead of time uh, which ones are trouble. So I, I can add this trouble field as a summary field, and this will bring it along in the data set without clustering on it. All right. Watch the internet will be down. So this would be a good time to mention that uh, although this demonstration has been all in the UI, um, this everything that, that we, all the machine learning algorithms we write, we expose in our API first. All right, so that every, everything that I'm showing you can be done through the API. Uh, and I do actually have a Python script that I wrote. I meant to port it into IPython, but I didn't, I didn't finish. Um, but it goes through this entire demo, every single step, uh, all of the random decision forest, uh, all of the, every step that I did uh, is done through our, in our Python binding. So I seem to recall one of these has just 10 in it. In our, so, th so in this visualization, we're just kind of seeing each of these clusters. Uh, and for each cluster, when you highlight it, you can see the information for the centroid over here and the data inspector. All right, so you can get an idea that the center of this has a loan amount of 9,000, for example, and a term of 36 months. Uh, and at least one of these clusters should have like 10 instances in it. That one's one. Eh, maybe I did something wrong. That's all right. We'll just move on. Okay. Um, now, this is, this is where... Um, thank you. <laughs> this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat. Uh, it's not really a cheat, but what I, what I want to do is I want to relabel each one of these clusters so that, they, so that I know how many, uh, what percentage of the loans in the cluster are trouble and which ones aren't. Okay, and there's, there's no easy way to do it through the UI, so I'm actually going to just do it through the, the API very quickly. Uh, and I just wrote a script that'll do it for me, except um, it would help if I did it right. Here, sorry. Should be very fast. So uh, all this is doing is it actually uses the cluster to make a batch prediction, it finds all the populations for the clusters, computes a percentage, and then relabels each of those clusters with the percentage of uh, how many instances in there were considered trouble. <coughs> A 
It's really fast. It is, I promise. All right. Ah, it is done, fantastic. All right, so if I hover over one of these now, you can actually see where there's before it used to be have a, a name that was like cluster zero, cluster one. It's actually been replaced with a floating point number. And so that, that cluster there is 0%. There's no, no loans marked as trouble in there. Um, well, no, that's a bug. Okay, but it would work. It would be fantastic if I didn't have a bug. I have five minutes left though, so we'll sc scoot on. But basically the idea is that I can reassign these clusters with a percentage, right? Give me an idea of the population that are um, considered trouble loans. And now I can do the exact same thing. I can do a batch centroid uh, over this cluster and take my data set that we've been building, right? The batch projection, batch anomaly score. And now I'm building up a data set that has the quality, the score, and the centroid that it got assigned to. And I'm like 30 seconds away. So. Uh, and we can actually pull this file down as a CSV. Right, and so now we have our open data set. These are all the loans we wanted to score. And for each one, we can see the quality, whether it's being predicted as good or bad. The anomaly score, which is telling us how similar it is to the data that we used to make the predictions. All right, and then, um, although it's not working, uh, we would see the percentage for the uh, loans that are similar to it uh, that were giving us trouble in, the, in making payments. And now, now I could use these three metrics to make my decisions. All right. So in closing, um, getting started, right? So this, this entire demonstration can be run in our development mode. Everything under 16 megs is free, so you actually don't need an account. But if you'd like to play with something bigger, uh, if you don't have an account already, then you can use this when you sign up. You can use this code, all right? And I think, you, I think it's actually a free three-month subscription, not one month. Um, if you already have an account, just shoot us an email at info big ML and I'll, I'll make sure you get a subscription. That's no problem. And... That's it. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Now, Robert, sorry, Paul. <laughs> uh, we we're going to have a short Q and A uh, turn now, so anybody who has a question can raise his hand or his hand, and uh, uh, Paul will be answering everyone. There's one. We got someone here. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, is the mic still on? Oh, yeah. Yep. So the, the question is, is based on, you know, have we considered doing naive, bay, naive Bayes for a, an additional algorithm? And, and the answer is um, not specifically. But the, the slightly longer answer, I won't make it too long, is that because we're trying to focus on making a tool that is both powerful and easy to use, we, we narrow it down to decision trees first because once you move them into random decision forests, uh, they're top performers, right? So there, there's a paper I can, I can show you where they compare like 10 different, met 10 different machine learning algorithms across a variety of machine learning problems. And the random decision forest is, you know, it's, it's like number one for a lot of them. And then when it's not number one, it's like number two. And in one or two cases, it's number three. And it's very, very close. Uh, it's the only one that's near the top all the time. But at the same time, you get all these other advantages where it's easy to visualize, easy to understand what it's doing. It's very extractable. I didn't show you, but we don't constrain these models. You can actually pull them out. Uh, and, and you can pull it out as Python or Java, Java or Ruby. You can, I mean, we can express it as a function that you can now deploy in your own cluster to make predictions. You know, so that, I mean, it's, we're basically giving you a programmatic model that you can implement and you do predictions on your own uh, and very, very quick. That's the other advantage. Decision trees are extremely fast at making predictions. And that said, um, we are planning to bring more algorithms. You will see more. Uh, it's just that, you know, before we bring one, we want to make sure it fits into the workflow and has the same you know, ease of use, uh, as parameter free as we can make it, where with still an advanced panel. So, uh, but Naive Bayes specifically, I, I, don't, I don't think it's on our immediate roadmap. No. We have another question at the top. Yeah. Hi, so, <coughs> sorry, uh, a couple of questions actually. Uh, number one is, do you do recommendations as well? And uh, number two is, uh, 
how big does this scale? Is there, is there a limit on the input data sizes? Yeah, so the, could, uh, I, I like the second question, but I, I know you asked the other one first, so we'll, uh, but could you repeat the first question? Whether you do recommendation as well as classification and clustering. Ah, yeah, so uh, like a recommender. Yeah. Uh, so not, not specifically, although we, we have had customers use our tool to do recommendation. They're usually you know, doing something with the uh, clustering, so you're doing, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, uh, but you're basically doing you know, like an XY, uh, some kind of a, man, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a product association and you can build a recommender that way. Uh, but as far as doing like a, uh, um, ah, I can't think of the word now, but no, no. So other than that, we don't have a specific recommender piece. Uh, on the scaling piece, the, the, without giving you too much of the background here, but this is, this is an interesting story. Um, when we started this project, we were like, man, we got to be big data. And this was like three or four years ago when we founded the company, right? We got to be huge. We're going to be huge. So we're going to petabytes. We're going to do it. And so we worked really hard to make these algorithms, the, the decision tree algorithm is not the standard algorithm. Okay, we've adapted it so that it works in a streaming fashion. Uh, so it doesn't have to have all the data in memory, uh, which means you can run data sets that are much larger than the physical memory. That's not normal for decision tree algorithm. We also paralyze it so different parts of the tree can be built in parallel. We do all these things to make it you know, very, very scalable. Uh, and then we talk to our customers, they're like, this is awesome, we're going to give you petabytes. And then when they actually go through and they clean out the data from 20 years ago, they don't actually need because it's not applicable anymore. And they take out the features that don't add any value, then they get like 100 megs. Uh, and, and we're going, you know, come on, 100 megs. Uh, you know, I got a PC at home with more memory than that, right? So, so then we adapted this year, uh, we created an in-memory algorithm that's like 10 times faster, but we still have the streaming algorithm. So right now we do this, this uh, nice vertical scaling architecture in our servers where we try to do it in memory. We send it to the server that's the right size. We have servers of different sizes. If it gets all the way to the last server and there's no more big ones, then we can switch to our streaming algorithm, which although is slower, can scale a lot farther. That said, we have an absolute hard limit right now of five terabytes. We have a way around it, but there hasn't been any customer demand, so we haven't, we haven't pushed it. Um, and then as far as things that we've done, we've had customers do hundreds of gigabytes for sure. And on the feature space, which is really the more complicated piece, right? Having big data sets isn't complicated. What's complicated is wide data sets. Uh, and the biggest we've done so far is 130,000 features. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? So thank you very much, Paul, for your talk. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And we're going to have a short 15-minute break for coffee, and we will return in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Steve.